Okay, um, sorry for the delay with that. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, this, uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about visual saliency prediction. Um, so, without going into what it is, I'm going to show an example so that we can get an idea of what, what I'm talking about at the start. Uh, if you've seen this example before, if you've been to one of these talks, uh, don't tell everyone else what it is. But uh, if you haven't, then just have a look at what I'm going to put on the slides here. Okay, so I want you to look at this, this picture just for a few seconds. And then I'm going to take it away. Okay, and then I'm going to put it back again. Okay, and the question is, what has changed in the picture? So has anyone, has anyone seen any change in the picture? Okay, will we, we look again? Okay, so blank the screen for a second. And bring it back. Anyone see what's changed? What's that? The bar? Yeah, okay. So keep an eye on this bar here. It goes right across. Okay. Go back. Oops. See, it goes up and goes down. Okay, let's try another one. What about this one here? Okay. Anyone see what's changed? Yeah, so if you look at this reflection in the water, right, you see the entire sort of reflection has changed. So that's a lot of pixels that just changed there, right? I mean, easily a third of the image pixels, I'd say, changed there. And it's quite hard to notice, right? So that seems a bit unusual. So what's going on? Um, well, what's going on is we don't really see the full image when we look at these kind of things. What we really see is just a certain small percentage of the image in high resolution, and everything else is really just a low resolution blur that our brain fills in with content that we kind of expect to be realistic for that thing, and we don't really notice, right? Uh, so we only look at certain parts, and then parts we call the salient parts. And the interesting thing is that these are the same parts for all humans, right? So basically, you can do experiments. You get a lot of different people to look at an image for three or four seconds, right? And you can measure where they look with an eye tracker. And pre people are very consistent, right? They tend to look in the same places, that certain interesting things, right? Um, so when we look at an image like that, what we perceive is, or what we think we see, is we see the whole image, all the pixels in equal resolution. That's what we, we think we see. Where we actually look, if you put an eye tracker on us, is where these heat maps are here. So we're looking at the faces and things like that. We're looking at what, 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 what faces interesting things and what, what the people in the image are actually looking at as well. That's the other thing that our, our attention gets drawn to. So what we actually see is something like this, right? And, you know, our brain tells us that we're seeing something really high fidelity, but we're not seeing something really high fidelity. Um, and if you look at that, then that quite explains nicely why we don't see the bar moving, because it's really blurry and in the background there. It's not really important. Our brain is just throwing out information that it doesn't think will be important, like background, all the time, right? And it allows us to focus on things that are important for us. Um, it'd be nice if we could somehow predict where humans look in images, right? Because there's a couple of applications you could make if you, if you could do this. For example, if you're doing image retrieval, um, you could upweight the features that occur in important parts, right? Because you know, the background is usually less important than the places where people look in the image for many, many tasks, right? Um, you could also focus more computational resources on certain parts of the image than in others, right? So you might want to process some things in very, very high resolution and then other things in a, in a lower resolution. Um, so there's many, many things you could do if you had a function that would go from image to where people look, right? And this, this task is called uh, saliency prediction. So to predict a heat map over the image where this is value is very high for places where it's very likely that a person will look and very low otherwise. Um, just to point out, there's another task that's related but different called salient object detection. And you'll hear both of them called saliency detection and things like that in the literature if you start getting interested in this area. And it turns out these are different tasks. So when people say when they mean salient object detection, they mean finding the single object in the image that is most salient, right? So in this example here, I mean, the idea would be to predict a binary mask, right, which is one inside the salient object and zero outside and has a crisp border, right? So this is different to the heat map output. So you'll see them two things in the literature. Um, I'm referring to the saliency prediction task, which is this one here. Okay, so we do deep learning, so we're interested in data sets because this is all very well and good, but we can't train anything if we don't have data, right? So what data sets are available for this task? Um, so the first data set um, that was kind of came out in 2012 
was the MIT 300 data set and it's still the sort of benchmark for um, saliency prediction algorithms. So if you develop a new saliency prediction algorithm for images, you'll typically run it on this data set, produce your heat maps, send them off to MIT, they'll evaluate them for you and put your score on a scoreboard. Okay? And that's, you can go into MIT or this stiff URL here, saliency.mit.edu results, and that will, that will show you who's doing the best at this task at the moment. Uh, so this data set is 300 images. Uh, it's 39 observers, so they basically average, they take fixations from each of the observers and average them over the images. Um, and it was done with a very high quality eye tracker. Um, but there's no training data here, unfortunately. You don't even get the, the ground truth, right? You, you just get the images. You can submit your saliency maps and they'll evaluate it. So there is ground truth, but it's not public, okay? So what do we do to train it? Well, well first of all, actually, before I talk about that, I'm just gonna talk about how you go from fixations um, to saliency maps because it's worth sort of knowing a little bit about that. So what these eye trackers actually give you is sort of like a line scan paths, right, going around like this where your eyes are going. And you want to somehow turn that into a heat map to places where people are going to look. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is detect fixations, right, because there's certain properties of your eyes, there's saccades where they'll just sort of jump around a little bit and you want to kind of filter that out. And you kind of want the places where, you, not where you're kind of tracking along but where you stop for a certain amount of time. So there's a bit of post-processing to do with you know, distance, velocity, thresholding, clustering, all that kind of stuff. To turn what's coming from the eye tracker into a set of dots all over the image. Okay? And once you have them set of dots, how do you turn that into a saliency map? Well, it's actually quite simple. You just take the dots, you render them onto as white pixels on a, on a black image. Okay? Then you blur it with a, a Gaussian with particular properties that are designed to match sort of how uh, the, the visual angle of our eye or give us some uncertainty. You blur that, and then you, you rescale it between zero and one, and you get a nice map like that. And this is just a black and white one, and it doesn't come up too good on the projector. I mean, going from that to this, it's just a, it's just a color map, right? There's nothing going on there. Um, okay, so that's how you create a saliency map. Um, um, so now we need some training data. Uh, so there's another data set from MIT, uh, MIT 1003. Uh, same, very similar to the other data set, like same capture rig, same number of people. So this is quite a similar domain data set that you can use for training. But 1003 images isn't really enough for us to do our deep learning. I mean, with more tricks perhaps, but just a direct, strongly supervised approach probably won't work so well with just this number of images. So what else can we do? Well, there's a couple of data sets out there that don't, that don't rely on high quality eye tracking. Um, and one of them is called the ISUN data set. And this is a kind of a clever thing what they did. Um, basically, they just use webcam based eye tracking, right? So it's not as accurate, but then they just get a lot more of it, right? So you've got these slightly less strong labels, but you've got a lot of them, right? And you can train on that. Um, another group called, uh, created this data set called Salicon. It means saliency in context, I think. Um, and what they discovered was they did some experiments with what's called artificial foveation, right? And artificial foveation is basically when you, you um, use a mouse to sort of simulate where you're looking, right? So anywhere that's underneath the mouse will look very crisp, as we can see in this image here. Uh, around the circle, that's where the mouse is, and everything else is blurry. And then you allow a person to explore the image with the mouse, and it just sort of makes it crisp what you can see right under the cursor and blurry everywhere else. And they get, got people to do this for a few seconds for many, many people. Um, and then they said, well, let's try correlate that with an, uh, an eye tracking experiment to see are other people you know, sort of looking in the same places as the mouse is going. And happily, uh, it did turn out that there was a very strong correlation between where people explored with the mouse and where they would look in the image if they were doing that. So they said, well, let's make this data set available to see if people can train saliency detectors on this. Um, and this is good because there's 10,000 training images. I think there might actually be more now because they've released several versions of this data set. Um, and they could cr collect it very easily because they could just use Amazon Mechanical Turk. No special equipment needed. Just a mouse, right? That's all. Um, and they have some cool algorithms for making sure that this artificial effoviation is nice and fast as well. Right? So that's the other data set. And this is a very common one. It seems to work quite well if you train on this. Okay, so let's see what some of the models that people have trained uh, for, for saliency. So uh, we were one of the first people to try and attack this with uh, deep learning when the Silicon data sets came out. Um, so this is a collaboration between uh, me and DCU and, and UPC. And we created this deep neural network where we basically just used transfer learning to, to use the, top, the, bo the bottom three layers. And we stacked on another five layers and some deconvolution. And we tried to train that end to end. Okay. Um, 
And this was before ResNets or any of that kind of stuff came out, right? So this is a basic feed-forward neural network. And this did really well, right? So we immediately got into the top three, I think, on the MIT saliency benchmark with all of the traditional algorithms below us, right? And then we're no longer there. I mean, there's better deep algorithms now, but I mean, it was, it was a very successful um, approach. Here's what um, some of the saliency maps look like. So the bottom one is the predicted one, and the middle one is the ground truth, and this is on unseen test data, right? So you can see that it does pretty well. It can figure out where the important parts of the image are, and it's, it's quite close to the ground truth. And indeed, this works even when the image is much more complicated, right? So um, here we have images like this one here. Where we've got lots of lights and various things going on, and we still get some reasonable results from it, right? So this, this seems like a good sort of a good model for, for saliency. There's a couple of places where it fails, though. Uh, so if you look at the woman eating the pizza there, um, the model does correctly get the fact that her face is salient and that the face of the child is salient, as, as with the ground truth. But it misses a little bit this bit here, right, which is the attention that the woman is paying to the pizza that she's eating. And some people say that area is going to be more or less salient depending on how hungry you are as well and various sort of things, right? But uh, basically, our models aren't good enough to get that p kind of level of abstraction yet. Um, but there is work on improving that, and people are doing stuff with gaze predictions of where are you looking, right? So this is something people put into it. Uh, we followed that up with, a, with a, another model uh, called Salgan. Again, this is available for free online, and you can download it. This is used by a lot of people. Um, and basically, we use a, a VGG encoder-decoder architecture here. Not shown on this are some skip connections as well. Um, and then train it with cross-entropy, right, which is a standard thing you usually train with these things. So you have this output. It's a binary output, right? So at each pixel, you, you can t treat that as a binary prediction. Okay? And then just use cross-entropy and then sum over the whole thing. Right? That's typically what people do, although people do other things as well. Um, and what we noticed was that that doesn't capture larger statistical dependencies. So saliency maps have a certain look to them. Right? And that's not going to be captured by a pixel-wise metric. Right? Um, so we used a GAN to try and be able to distinguish between generated saliency maps and, and non-generated saliency maps by propagating through it to uh, make a better model. So that's Sal GAN. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but that just basically improved performance over a previous SalNet benchmark, or model, sorry. Um, so what have other people done? Well, uh, one of the earlier ones as well was this idea. This isn't trained end-to-end -end or anything, but it was just uh, a simple thing that you can try, and it worked remarkably well, I think. Uh, this model is called Deep Gaze 1. Basically, they took a pre-trained uh, Alex net, right, which is up here. So this is trained on ImageNet. And then you take all of the features from each of the layers, and you resize them so that they're all the same size, right, just by doing up sampling or interpolation or whatever you want. So you have this big, long chunk of features, this um, one of these for each pixel. And then you just take a linear combination of the features, and you make that predict the output, right? So this is just like having the output of all of this in a single linear layer, if you like to think that way, or, you know, uh, logistic regression, you can think of it that way as well. Okay, and that will produce a saliency map, and then they combine that with a, a prior, right? So that basically the prior is saying that in the absence of other information, where would people look? Probably in the middle, okay? So it just incorporates that little bit of bias towards the middle, okay? That's a really, really simple thing to do, and that worked all right. Like, it wasn't, it's not too bad. They're, um, they have good results on, on the MIT saliency map part. Why might that work? Well, we would expect that um, AlexNet and various things do already have features hidden in there that respond to interesting things like faces, right? So we can expect that a linear combination of these features might correspond to interesting things too. Okay, so that's essentially why it, it works. And going up in complexity from that, um, a lot of people have done multi-resolution approaches, right? So taking features from different parts of the network and combining them. The difference between this and the previous one is that this is trained end to end and not just a, a little linear combination on the top. And they basically upscale all of these features in a similar way. And then instead of having a linear predictor, they use some convolutions on, on the end and predict the settings map. And instead of using a center prior, which is just engineered, right? People look at the center, they actually learn the prior from the data, because of course you can look at all the data, average all of the saliency maps together, and then you know where people look on average without actually having to uh, guess, right? And it's usually, it's going to be in the middle anyway. And here they're using a multiplication instead of a, an addition. Um, Salicon again took a multi-scale approach. So you got the um, same network applied at two different scales, 
features fused by concatenation, then that's used to predict the salience map. The novel aspect here is what they did is notice that some of the metrics that we care about when we're um, evaluating saliency, so I'm going back here, like these are all saliency metrics, so we've got KL divergence, normalized scan path, correlation coefficient, and so forth. Some, not all of them, are, are differentiable, so if they're differentiable, we can just use them directly as a loss function, right? So they just combine a bunch of them and use them as loss functions, right? So that's, that's another sort of innovation. How much of a difference it makes, it's not clear, right? Um, and then deep fix is kind of one of the more sophisticated ones where they really try to put a lot of things in. Uh, so this is VGG, 16, at the top, replacing anywhere they would have downsampled with max pooling, with a, removing the max pooling and making the convolution to come after it dilated, right? So it's a compatible convolution as it was before, right? That means they can reuse the weights that were previously learned, right? Um, so that's a nice little trick that they have. So if you ever need to, you know, take a network that goes down like this, and then reuse it in a sort of a segmentation task or saliency prediction task, you can go and take out the max pooling layers and change the dilation coefficient on the layers just after where the max pooling would have been, and then you get a network that's broadly compatible with what you had beforehand. They also have a few other tricks in here, like they have uh, location-based convolution, which is what they call, basically they just give it a few extra, um, extra locations sort of images to tell you kind of tell the convolution where it is in the image because the idea is that convolutions doesn't matter it doesn't doesn't know where it is it's the same operation applied everywhere but if things are more important in the middle maybe you should know you're somewhere near the middle and you want to give the convolution a little bit of a hint as to where it is in the image right so that's that's what they're trying to do there and this is probably one of the top performing models that is there at the moment um, Still room for innovation in this space, so this is a paper from AAAI 2019 where people started to use um, Fourier features as well as just regular RGB as inputs, right? So in the inputs they use the RGB channel and then the two, you know, components of the Fourier transform for each of them as well, right? And then they have some, you know, complex um, convolutions which is just like a convolution with a special, um, special non-linearity in there. Um, so I think, you know, this is an interesting direction and particularly if we could do, so they, they call this transform domain um, saliency prediction but it actually uses RGB as well which is kind of means you have to decode it but it would be interesting to see if you could do saliency efficiently not in the you know the, the decoded domain but in the in the original encoded coefficients that would be an interesting thing to see. Um, and another thing that people seem to do as well is they use a mixture of learned which we have on the left here and engineered these are just difference of Gaussian features, and that seems to help in some cases. So the people are in introducing extra features into the networks to say that you know, these are the kind of things that might be important. So these are the kind of things that people are trying. Okay, so that's the um, image saliency stuff. So that's interesting, and a lot of progress has been made there. Recently, people have started to focus more on video saliency, and there's some new data sets out for video saliency as well now, um, which make this kind of a, will, will probably make it a more popular task going forward. Um, so how would you tackle uh, video saliency, given what we know? Well, one thing that works surprisingly well is just to take an image saliency algorithm, a very high quality one, and apply it frame for frame. Right? That actually gives, that's actually not a bad baseline, surprisingly. Um, but that's not going to pick up on anything like motion, right? because it doesn't know anything like motion. So what these guys decided to do was, so this is, this is just SALnet, which, which we had. right? Um, and then they, they took the sal net and they modified it a bit, right, to try and integrate some information about motion. So what low-level features capture motion that we can easily, well, not so easily, but it's a little bit complicated to compute them, but we can compute them. Um, one is optical flow, right, so optical flow is often used in action classification and various things like that. So in this particular network, they take optical flow and the RGB, put them into, you know, this is just the first part of SALnet, that's the first part of SALnet, and then they stick a new head on top of it that fuses the results together. And the idea is this way they can capture motion features as well, right? So that's, that's a simple, straightforward way of doing it. Um, CVPR 2018, people do more sophisticated things, so um, this is a, a model which is basically does some of the stuff that you would think, so at the very top we have state-of-the-art saliency model and then just stick a convolutional LSTM on the end of it, right, to try and capture some sort of motion dynamics. That's kind of the obvious thing you would do. But that doesn't capture any low-level motion. That only captures the changes in the high-level features, right? So you can think about it as a changing semantics almost, which isn't quite what you want, right? But 
Uh, it still could help, for example, smooth out the predictions so that they don't change very much between the frames. Um, they have some other interesting things here as well. So the second path down here is, is a totally different neural network trained to detect the gaze path of a person, right? So that's that, where is this person looking at? Let's put some saliency on that as well, because we know that happens, right? So that's an interesting thing to do. And then these last ones are based on sort of things that we, we notice that happen to people in video that we don't know, but we know don't, doesn't happen in images. So one is that if you're watching a video, and there's a person there, right? And they're walking across the screen and then they leave the shot, right? Your, your attention bounces back to the middle, right? That's called an attentional bounce. So that's, they have a pathway for that, right? It sort of detects if people leave and then allows this, they're just using some center biases to, to allow it to bounce back to the middle. Um, and then a rapid scene change. As soon as you get a, a change in scene, no matter where your attention was, it'll go back to the middle again. So they try to integrate a few different things into it that way and get good performance. Um, and this is kind of a, another new one as well, um, where they basically integrate attention into saliency, right? So there are different things, right? Attention in, in vision usually refers to, it's usually latent attention, right? So you, you learn some mask that you then multiply back to your features and then you can, you know, attend to somewhere spatially. Um, there's various different ways of doing attention. Um, a lot of this stuff comes from, from, from speech as well, right? Where people want to attend to different parts of the sentences and stuff like that. So that's, that's general attention. And then they, yeah. they plug attention into the saliency so that they can say things like, you know, we're paying attention to saliency and things like that. So, um, and then there's, you know, this is an LSTM on, on the end here as well, right? So that, that's sort of their dynamic saliency model. And that uh, gets very good results on their, this is the benchmark that actually the people who created that model also created. Okay, so uh, surprisingly they have the top results at the moment. But you can see the second one there is Salgan just applied frame per frame, right? It's not doing too badly. And with a few simple tricks, it's actually not so difficult to beat the state of the art on this, although uh, you need to have a publication for the results to show up on top of it. Um, there's some other tasks that are interesting as well. One is, is generating uh, realistic scan paths. So in the previous uh, sort of things we were talking about was talking about generating saliency maps, heat maps of where people look. But what would you, if you'd like to actually get a realistic sort of scan path where a person would actually actually look. Um, and there's some applications to this. I know that Technicolor had a challenge on, on doing this in 360 degree images because they wanted to be able to predict, you know, where a person will look soon enough, right, so that they can render those areas in more higher fidelity, right? That was, that's an application. And also, I mean, if you can generate scan paths, then you just, and you can sample them, and then you just sample a bunch of them and then you can create a heat map, right? So you can kind of solve both problems simultaneously. Um, we actually tried to solve it the other way when we, when we looked at this was, what we, we tried to do is instead of predicting just a saliency map, we predict a volume, right? Where the volume, different slices through the volume correspond to different times because we wanted to capture the fact that some things are interesting at the start and then other things are interesting later on. And, you know, everybody's going to look straight away at the big, you know, red thing in the room or, or whatever. And then, you know, if you have, you have more attention to look around, you might look at something else, right? So there's a time aspect of this. Um, so we, we basically quantize time. So say, you see, images are usually shown for about three seconds. So you can think of, we had a 30, t equals 30 here. So we basically broke it up into 30 little, little time steps and then predict salience at each one. And then to generate a scan path, we can sample from that volume. So we just go to t equals one, sample, a point with probability equal to the saliency there, move to t equals two, sample another point and so forth, and that generates scan paths. Um, and there's some of the scan paths that you can generate using this, and if you follow that link there, you can find the model and run it yourself and things like that if you want. Uh, we had another work to uh, follow that up that actually does it directly, right? So it just uh, it uses a GAN and a, and, a, and a recurrent neural network to kind of just predict the point, 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 point. It's a bit more complicated, so I'm not going to go into it here, but if you're interested in the problem, you can find it there. And that's an example of the output. And then the state of the art in this is, looks something like this, right? And this is a bit complicated, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the interesting bit is this bit here. So um, basically, this is an um, in inhibition of return region of interest network. And what that ba tr basically tries to do is predict at each step uh, where you're looking next and where you shouldn't look next because you just sort of look there recently, right? So that's an inhibition of return. You, you know, if you've just seen something and you're, you're exploring somewhere else, you're not going to just keep re returning to it because it's salient. You're going to like inhibit that part of you that's looking at it for a while until you explore 
other regions, right? And they basically learn all of this directly from the data, right? Because you have the scan paths and you can kind of figure this stuff out. Uh, interestingly as well, they also use like a, a sort of an auxiliary <laughs> task where you predict a saliency map because that helps to regularize things as well, right? So saliency uh, map prediction or saliency prediction is very related to scan path prediction. So why not train on both of them at the same time, right? And do a multitask thing. So that's essentially what they're doing there. Um, so you can find more, more information on that in the paper. Um, and also, I mean, I'll put these slides up. I, I just realized that they weren't where I thought they were, but um, I'll, I'll copy them to where I thought they were. And you can actually go and follow that link and train your own saliency model. So I created a very small version of the Salicon data set called Mini Salicon. Uh, it'll run inside a Google Colab notebook, and I have a Colab notebook there, and there's one that's trained, and you can look at the outputs. Basically, I train a UNET on it, right? I don't know if anybody's ever tried training a UNET on saliency before, but it seems like an obvious thing to do, uh, and it works quite well. I haven't evaluated it. It could be state-of-the-art. It could be terrible. I have no idea. So if you're interested in saliency, I suggest you evaluate that and see where you are <laughs> um, on the MIT benchmark or, or something like that. Okay? So that's all on saliency. So any questions on that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yep, no problem. Sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> I'll see you later. Yeah.